sevenfold material elements, which is covered by sevenfold material elements, is the subject for the Virat conception. For report, simultaneously the Lord has multifarious other forms, and all of them are identical with the original fountainhead of all of the form of the Lord, uh, Sri Krishna. <coughs> In the Bhagavad Gita, it has been proven that the original transcendental and eternal form of the Lord is Sri Krishna, the absolute personality of Godhead, but by his inconceivable internal potency, Atma Maya, he can expand himself by multifarious forms and incarnations simultaneously without being diminished in his full potency. He is complete and although innumerable complete forms emanate from him, he is still complete without any loss. That is his spiritual or internal potency. In the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, the personality of Godhead Lord Krishna manifested his Virat Rupa just to convince the less intelligent class of men who cannot conceive of the Lord as appearing just like a human being. That he is factually, that he factually has the potency of his claim to be the supreme absolute person without any rival or superior. Materialistic men can think, although very imperfectly, of the huge universal space comprehending an innumerable number of planets as big as the sun. They can see only the circular sky overhead and without any information that this universe, as well as many other hundreds of thousands of universes, are each covered by sevenfold material coverings of water, fire, air, sky, ego, noumenon, and material nature, just like a huge football pumped and covered, floating in the water, the cause of ocean. Uh, wherein the Lord is lying as Maha Vishnu. All the universes in seed are emanating from the breathing of Maha Vishnu, who is but part of a partial expansion of the Lord. And all the universes presided over by uh, the Brahmas vanish when the Maha Vishnu withdraws his great breath. In this way, the material worlds are being created and vanished by the supreme will of the Lord. The poor, foolish materialist can just imagine how ignorantly he puts forward an insignificant creature to become his rival incarnation simply on the allegations of a dying man. The Virat Rupa was particularly exhibited by the Lord just to give lessons to such foolish men so that one can accept a person as the incarnation of Godhead only if such a person is able to exhibit such a Virat Rupa as Lord Krishna did. The materialistic people may uh, concentrate, a uh, person may uh, concentrate his mind upon the Virat or gigantic form of the Lord in his own interest and as recommended by Sukadev Goswami. Uh, but he must be on his guard not to be misled by pretenders who claim to be the identical person as Lord Krishna, but are not able to act like him or exhibit the Virat Rupa comprehending the whole of the universe. Translation of a gigantic universal form of the personality of Godhead within the body of the universal shell, which is covered by seven-fold material elements, is the subject for the Virat conception. Uh, So uh, here's a more detailed uh, description of this uh, Purusha, Virat Purusha, or here called the Vairaja Purusha, uh, or the gigantic universal form, uh, who is here considered to be a form of Bhagavan. Uh, so, uh, this form is uh, a uh, person residing within the coverings of the universe, uh, which are here described as seven layers. Uh, so, uh, we know from Bhagavatam and other Vedic literatures that uh, we don't have one universe. We have 
countless universes, infinite number of universes, uh, like there are bubbles in the ocean. So we don't, we can never count the bubbles in the ocean. So you can never count the number of universes there are. This is a little bit different from modern scientific conception where we talk of only one universe, which is everything in existence. Yeah. And then within that universe, then we have galaxies, which are like the bubbles, <laughs> so to speak. And then within each galaxy, then we have so many suns and planets and things like this. Uh, so this is uh, a little bit different concept. We can say the, the universes are like uh, little coconut bubbles, <laughs> something like that with shells of coconut on them with seven layers of different elements. And then within that, there's a space like inside the coconut. And the coconut has a little water in the bottom, and then it has the, uh, above that we have the uh, earth planets and all the planetary systems within there. And all this is called the universal form. Uh, all these planetary systems are considered to be like a, a figure, a person. And that's the universal form within that big coconut shell or the undercosha described here. Uh, so, and then we have not one, but we have millions of these universes floating around in the uh, what we call the Karana Ocean, the ocean of the causal ocean, huh? and along with that we have Mahavishnu sleeping, huh? and it's through Mahavishnu and his breathing that all of these universes emanate, and then they grow up and with the shell, and inside the shell, then we get this universal form in each of these universes. Huh? Uh, so it's not one universal form, it's billions and billions and billions of uh, universal forms manifesting within billions and billions of universes. Uh, and, um, of course, um, all of this uh, exists from our point of view for a long period of time. We know that Brahma has a, a lifetime of 100 years and uh, each year of Brahma uh, is uh, has 360 days, huh? and 360 d each day consists of a thousand yuga cycles of day and a thousand yuga cycles of night, and each yuga cycle is over four million years. So one day of Brahma is quite long, and then we have another night, and then we have a year, and then we have 100 years, and that's the length of the universe. <laughs> so for us, it's a long period of time, billions and billions of years. But from the bigger point of view, it's nothing. So uh, the universe is last as long as the, uh, the Mahavishnu breathes out. And when he breathes in, it's all gone. So within a few seconds, so maybe five or six seconds of Mahavishnu's time, we get the creation of all the universes and then they stay there and then again they all disappear again with the, like breathing of Mahavishnu. <laughs> So within a few seconds, we have all the creation and destruction of all billions and billions of universes going on. And it keeps going on. Creation, destruction, creation, destruction, because Mahavishnu is just sitting there breathing. <laughs> and he goes on like this forever. So we have continual creation and destructions of billions and billions of universes going on. Uh, and, the, and the length of each universe is nothing from uh, the point of view of Mahavishnu, but from our point of view it can be billions and billions of years. Huh? Yeah, so, um, in this way uh, we see that uh, all the universes fit within Mahavishnu when he breathes in they all disappear within the body of Mahavishnu. So we have billions and billions of universes all like little molecules like this, stuck inside the Mahavishnu and when he breathes them out they all come out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so like we can say all the universes uh, uh, together that composes we can say in one sense the body of Mahavishnu billions and billions of universes uh, but of course they are material and the body of Mahavishnu is spiritual so they're quite different but uh, from this we can understand that the mm, Supreme Lord has an infinite dimension compared to the universes <laughs> because they are nothing in comparison to the size of Mahavishnu and they all fit within him. So similarly, within this universe, when we make down to one little tiny universe, it's like one little atom of our air molecule or something like that. Within that little shell, then we get uh, this uh, universal form there inside each of these universes. 
So that, for, from Mahavishnu's point of view, that's a little small, a little small universal form. But from our point of view, it's huge because it's the whole universe as we know it, <laughs> one universe. And that constitutes from the topmost planet to the bottommost planet with all the living entities and all the material elements, all that is the universal form within one universe. So one body is there, one gigantic body. So for us, even the universal form looks huge or gigantic. But actually from Mahavishnu's point of view, it's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, this uh, universal form here is described as a Purusha. He's a person. Yeah. And uh, he becomes the object of meditation for the less advanced yogis. Yeah. Uh, so, through this, the uh, uh, yogis can understand that uh, the Supreme Lord does have a form. And that form is a form of a person. So that much is the positive aspect of this meditation. Negative aspect is it's not actually a, 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 a spiritual form, it's a material form. So therefore it's an inferior type of meditation because of that. So in this way we have a, um, a uh, method by which uh, less spiritual people can begin to um, meditate on the Supreme Lord in some way or other they can do that. Huh? So this is one form of doing it. Huh? Uh, uh, in the previous verse, Srila Prabhupada mentions there's a, a different way <laughs> and which you can, by which we can accomplish the same thing for less advanced people. Uh, but that is through the process of bhakti. So this is for people who are not devotees, really. They're just kind of spiritual yogis and things like that, not really devotees. So they have difficulty accepting that uh, the Lord has a spiritual form. Uh, if we say, uh, you meditate on the formless, they're very easy. They say, okay, fine, we accept the formless. When we talk about a form or a purusha, a person, it's more difficult for them to meditate on that as being uh, spiritual. Uh, however, if one uh, is a devotee of the Lord, and even if he's less advanced, mm, at the beginning of our bhakti, we accept um, that the Lord has a personal form, uh, and that he is supreme and is spiritual. Uh, uh, well, so that's one of the, the basic, uh, you'd say, um, tenets that we have to accept at the beginning of performing bhakti yoga. Uh, we're trying to establish a relationship with a person uh, who has a form, uh, but who is also spiritual. Uh, so that's what we have to accept, to accept the process of bhakti yoga. Mm -hmm. However, because we are mm, beginners, uh, uh, like the yogis, uh, we don't have complete faith or whatever. So, uh, therefore, it, it's more or less, we can say, a, uh, provisional. Yes, we accept, though we don't really understand what it is, we accept it okay, on faith. Okay. But, uh, along with that, we have um, devotion. So, if we accept on faith the form, and then we begin to uh, serve that form and meditate on that form with devotion, then gradually the, uh, that conception of the Lord with the spiritual form becomes clearer and clearer to us. Okay? Uh, so, uh, in this way we, can, uh, we don't have to use a material form first, like the universal form, we can simply uh, accept the spiritual form of the Lord and by uh, constantly um, serving that form, uh, then uh, we can realize that and appreciate the spiritual nature of the Lord. Uh, to help us in that endeavor, then we have the deity forms. Uh, so therefore, uh, we have spiritual sound, then it has a spiritual form also. <laughs> so therefore we have uh, 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 the name of Krishna, spiritual sound. It has its own form, which is Krishna. Why? Why not? <laughs> if material sounds have forms, notes of the scale have forms, which are material, then we have spiritual sound, spiritual form. Why not? 
So therefore we have the spiritual sound Krishna and we get the spiritual form Krishna manifesting very nicely. So when we develop nicely and we have the devotion, then uh, that spiritual sound manifests as spiritual form, non-different. Uh, in the spiritual, I would say Brahma Samhita also says that uh, uh, all the different senses can perceive what the other sense perceives. They're more or less one is equal to the other. <laughs> so sound is taste and taste is hearing, etc., etc., like that. So kind of interchangeable. Um, or you can experience everything with all the senses at once. <laughs> so therefore you experience Krishna. Uh, and um, not, that means we hear him, we see him, we taste him. Uh, we have all sorts of senses operating at once in our experience of Krishna. Uh, and it's not limited, our senses are not limited like in the material world anymore. Uh, so hearing Krishna becomes seeing Krishna and experiencing Krishna in different ways. It's quite different from our material limitation. Uh, so therefore the uh, sound Krishna and the form of Krishna and the seeing Krishna, etc. Uh, it's, it's not difficult to understand that one is equal to the other because in the spiritual world um, senses do not operate in the same way. They're not so limited as in this material world. Uh, so uh, therefore the Krishna is non different from his name and the sound of his name. Uh, so that's the easiest approach for us in Kali Yuga, through the sound, then gradually we can develop and appreciate that form of spiritual form of Krishna and advance. However, here we find that um, Sukadev Goswami is taking a very gradual approach for the yogi, <laughs> because there were many yogis in the audience there listening. So he's uh, going through a little yoga process here and talking about how the unadvanced yogis will meditate on the universal form, etc. And if we look in throughout the uh, second canto and the third canto, at least six times we have descriptions of this universal form taking place. <laughs> uh, just to emphasize that uh, um, uh, if you're um, on a lower level, at least accept a form. <laughs> the Lord has a form at least. Even if you're thinking it's a material form, at least give a form to that Supreme Lord and use that as your object of meditation. Uh, okay, any questions? Hmm. The question is that uh, if the speaker uh, of the Bhagavatam is a devotee, but the devotee is not really advanced, so therefore he still has impurities, if he speaks, that we absorb those impurities. Is that a question, more or less? Yeah. Uh, say in one sense, yes, but um, the um, when we're talking about pure, we have to be also a little careful because. Um, we have a definition of pure bhakti given by Rupa Goswami, Anya Abhilashita Shunya, etc. Uh, that's a general definition that covers sadhana, bhava, and prema. So therefore, those who are doing sadhana can be called pure devotees in one sense because they're practicing pure bhakti. But they're not really pure because they have an arta, as they're going through you know, anartana, vritti, nishta, ruchi, asakti before they get to bhava. And even bhava is not completely pure. <laughs> 
and only prema is pure. So when we talk about pure devotees and uh, pure bhakti, we're not always talking about prema. We're talking about that whole gamut of bhakti from the beginning up till the end, if it's done with that intention at least of not trying to enjoy for ourselves and giving everything to Krishna. <laughs> but we may not be pure, we may have an artist, etc. So we, we call those persons the Madhyamadikaris, also pure bhaktas, because uh, they're accepting the process of pure bhakti and they're dedicating themselves to that process. But they're not pure, so they show an artist sometimes also. <laughs> so these uh, Madhyamadikaris become the main preachers. Of course we have people in Bhava and Prema preaching, but they're rare anyway. And of those rare people, not all of them preach because they may be in trance all the time. Huh? Like Sukadev Goswami was not always preaching. He was <laughs> 16 years. He was silent <laughs> before he came out and preached to um, Pariksha Maharaj. So uh, it's not that they're always going to be preaching. So the main activities are done by the Madhyamadikaris, uh, but and, and they're not pure in the, in the in the absolute sense. But at least they're accepting the process of pure bhakti. So therefore, we label them as pure devotees. And if they preach, fine. Okay, we accept that. <laughs> Now, they may have some uh, inartists or whatever like that. Hopefully, in, in, when they're explaining Bhagavatam, that's not going to come up and they're only presenting the, <laughs> the pure bhakti aspect of it uh, with good intentions like that. And therefore, we won't get any bad effect from that and we can get the good things. If they start manifesting all sorts of inartists at a certain point and, that, and also their, their whole ideas become a little distorted, that obviously is going to affect us also. So we have to be careful of that. that um, those devotees don't become overly affected by material and artists and that begins to influence their speaking and their bhakti and their classes, etc. Huh. I'm just going to say that uh, also uh, along with that, you know, you have the atmosphere of the temple with the deities and the other, other devotees who were sitting. Yeah. Uh, so if, if from time to time, as you explain, <laughs> and art is manifest. Yeah. That, that, that effect would be uh, uh, minimized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Minimized yeah. because yeah. of the whole city. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's why the uh, Prophet established, uh, you know, he's about to come in the temple, mm. he's in front of the and association. association. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the other point, of course, of course, is that we are taking the Bhagavatam, which is presenting pure bhakti, and then we have Prabhupada's commentary also, which is pure, and it's not going off, and <laughs> he keeps telling us, okay, don't mix it with other things, don't hear from the materialists, all that sort of thing. So there's a lot of uh, safeguards to keep us on the right track. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. It's okay. <laughs> Just, just along those lines that Nick um, Blue was um, talking about, what about in different yoga studios? Um, they'll, um, you know, chant some bhajans and not chant the whole thing, but they're not actually devotees. Yeah. So, um, is there any positive effect about that uh, on, on the um, attendees of the? Of the <laughs> well, it would depend on their intentions, and that probably their intentions would depend on the teacher's intention when they are chanting. Are they trying to merge in Brahman, or are they trying to whatever? So um, definitely, they're trying to be spiritual, I suppose, in one sense. But then that's a little bit what is spirituality and all that may be a little vague for them also. So they can elevate to some degree, and the name is so flexible that it can accommodate. You can get liberation from it. You can get material things, or you can get prema from the name. Um, so they're probably not going to get up to prema through that, but at least they can get a little purified and rise to satvagun and maybe get a little bit of, you know, liberation type tendency there through that. And if, if there's a little personal devotion, they can even get a little influence of Vaishnav, you know, tendency there as well. It would depend on the intentions of the people and the leader, I suppose. Describe an interesting point about the vibration of different objects. Mm. Um, that some objects can vibrate in a spiritual way that resonates with the vibration, in the vibration of the soul. Yeah. So the question is, is about that uh, property of vibration. Is that uh, a property of the object or a property of the one who sees that object? What I mean to say is, if there is a flower and this flower is offered to the Lord, 
Yeah. Then I don't think that this flower vibrates with the spiritual energy. Yeah, and if you offer it to a materialist, then it have a material vibration. So, is that vibration something which is pertinent to the object itself, or it depends upon the person who sees? Well, in terms of spiritual vibration, it's going to depend on the devotion. So if we offer something to, with devotion, like uh, food, then it becomes prashadam. So it's got a spiritual vibration. If you don't offer, then it's a material vibration that may give you sattva, rajas, or tamas according to the quality of the food. So the, the spiritual vibration will depend upon the person, the, the devotee, uh, and his preparation and his offering of it, huh? which is a little more subtle, <laughs> but more important for us. <laughs> It's interesting about vibrations uh, in the material world. Uh, there is uh, there's one Japanese, uh, not scientist or something. They, some people reject this thing also. But anyway, it's an interesting thing that a uh, heat experiment with water, yeah? uh, and then you freeze water, and then it goes into crystals. So then uh, you have water, and then you uh, uh, think negative thoughts in the water, and you and you freeze it. And then the crystals are all irregular. <laughs> And if you have nice uh, prayerful thoughts and compassionate thoughts or whatever, and you freeze the water, nice symmetrical crystals, etc., like that. So you find what you can do different types of music and stuff like this, harsh music, and then it comes out all irregular. And you have nice classical music, and it comes out all symmetrical like this. So <laughs> you could, the, the water itself was affected by the different vibrations that hit it in terms of mental vibrations or physical vibrations of sound, etc. And that would affect the crystal structure of the water <laughs> when it was frozen. <laughs> so mental, even mental effects, uh, uh, whether it's material or spiritual, they can affect matter to some degree. Yeah. And of course, water is water is in everything. You know, most uh, organic things have water in them, so <laughs> the, the get organic thing matter is going to get affected. Food is going to get affected very easily by our mental vibrations. <laughs> so if we have spiritual vibrations, then it easily affects the food. <laughs> is there any significance in the Purusha part of lying in the ocean water? Mm. Like why don't they sit under a tree or, you know, is there any significance to that? Uh, yeah, we have Mahavishnu in the Karna Ocean, we have Garbhadaka in the Garbhadaka Ocean, and Kuradaka Vishnu in the Milk Ocean. <laughs> so it doesn't really explain why, you know, or, or, or what's the significance of that. But um, uh, And of course, all these waters are not really material waters, it's more like a spiritual environment. Uh, so I suppose there's water only in the, um, from, let's say, metaphorical sense in one, <laughs> one way, huh? that that's their uh, environment, their um, spiritual environment, so to speak. That's, that's the next step for the yogi. Uh, the yogi, immature yogis can meditate on the Virata Rupa or the universal form, which is basically material elements. When he gets more advanced, then he meditates on Paramatma. So, so that's a spiritual form. So it has, uh, and he is the source of material things, but he is not material. He's a spiritual form. So uh, they meditate on a form but it's not a material form with material elements in it, but he's the cause of manifesting material elements. So like Mahavishnu and Garbhadaksha Vishnu are forms of Paramatma, and they produce the material elements, etc. But he's completely separate and untouched by them. So that's the higher type of meditation of more advanced yogis. So in one sense, the universal form is like a step between yeah. realization and Paramatma realization. No, it's lower. Uh, universal form is the lowest, then to Paramatma. Oh, well, Paramatma and Brahman are kind of like equal, we would say. Uh, the, uh, the, the yogi will go from the Virat Rupa to the Paramatma and then uh, try to merge into Paramatma, perhaps. <laughs> and the jnani will go directly to Brahman and merge in Brahman. 
a little bit different process to get to the Brahman from the Paramahama Yogi. Okay, Hare Krishna.